any of the fields that sometimes we just have access to a little piece of the information and then that's all that our brain remember. And then in future in the time, you get maybe somebody else that mentioned something about, do you see this rapid expansion in adults? And they will controversy the point just because what they remember from dental school is say rapid expansion is only working for kids. So the approach that we have with our great speakers, Mariana Evans, who is a uh, orthodontist, but also a periodontist, is what is called non-surgical mid-facial develop in adults, airway, periodontal, and all the uh, uh, periodontal implications. So before any go any further, let me pass it to Hamid. So we say a welcome to our guest tonight. Hello, Mariana, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I, Thank you so much for fantastic. your presentation. Fantastic. This has been one of the interviews I've been uh, very much uh, looking forward to as a, as a practitioner that uh, delves uh, both into ortho and surgery. Uh, oh, I've been looking forward to this to uh, to to see what you have and and kind of pick your brains and and uh, uh, so I'm very excited to see what you have to say about us. Uh, um, so <clears throat> without further ado, um, if you, um, Javier, you want to do a brief introduction of uh, yeah. how you... So first, Mariana, Mariana and I, we met, we have the opportunity to be lecturing together at the Academy of Equilibration Society. Uh -huh. So then I finished my lecture, I left the room, and then when I come back, the first thing that I see is a uh, CVCT with like 10, 12 millimeters between in that rough air. And I wasn't even followed, but then when I see that, I was just blow away. I say, what the hell is this? I need to stay. And my wife was waiting for me. I say, no, there's no way that I'm going to leave this room without knowing what's going on. And for my own look, I didn't even know. But this year in January, I was with the Arnett group in the maxillofacial group getting trained. And one of the speakers was here, but we didn't even connect. We have to go to dinner together. And when we start to say, we didn't meet before? And then from that point, after that she made that lecture, I say, everybody needs to know that. Everybody needs to know this because we always trying to gain airway. And mostly even that we're trying to be a little disruptive with treatments because like Hamid and I, we normally use sponsors for our, our, our treatment. Mostly the sponsor technique that we use is conventional three ways that is making the movement from the teeth simultaneously with some benefits, of course, but also with some tipping that is not what we want. And the point that I learned from her is how the body reacts when you make a maxillary expansion when you're not holding structures to the periodontal ligament because it's a totally different response. And that's what she get to that magnificent. So let's hear to first of all, tell us a little bit about how you make this uh, uh, transition uh, from periodontist to orthodontist or vice versa. And then how you start doing in something that is not common. Don't call it, let's call it disruptive because it's not a standard care. So let us get a little bit about that. And then of course I have another technical questions to engage the audience in what we're doing. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Well, first of all, I uh, started my uh, dental career back in Ukraine and in Moldova, uh, which is uh, part of Eastern Europe. And uh, I always wanted to be a periodontist. When I was a dental student, I wanted to be a periodontist. I come from the family of dentists. I'm a third generation dentist and I knew a little bit about restorative dentistry when I um, started dental school and I always wanted to be a little bit closer um, to biology rather than uh, mechanics. Uh, so I was introduced to periodontics uh, during my education and I really fell in love. So my first uh, three years before I came to the United States, I uh, practiced as a periodontist in Ukraine and doing very minimal surgery, no implants, just periodontal maintenance, getting into periodontics because we didn't have back then in Ukraine specialty of uh, periodontology as we have in the United States. 
And I learned very quickly that um, periodontal health is impossible without uh, proper occlusion. If you compare patients that had a little bit better occlusion to patients that had severe malocclusion, patients with severe malocclusion had very little chance to succeed with periodontal treatment. So occlusion is extremely important for periodontal stability and the healing of the periodontal lesion. Uh, so by the time I uh, came to the United States to continue my education um, in the United States, I realized that I need to know a little bit more about occlusion so I can have, help patients with periodontal uh, treatment. So I uh, was accepted to University of Pennsylvania Advanced Standing Program in 2005 and four. Uh, so when I started my program, one of the first lectures that I attended was by uh, Dr. Robert Van Arstel. Dr. Robert Van Arstel at that time was a head of orthodontic uh, department and also was a head of combined perio ortho program. And he was also dual uh, trained in periodontics and orthodontics. So he gave this uh, outstanding lecture to the dental students on the link between occlusion, a periodontal lesion, and the interdisciplinary treatment. And when I saw his lecture, I said to myself, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So I am going to pursue my career in this combined uh, education, uh, interdisciplinary treatment. And I was very fortunate to get accepted to uh, the combined perioortho program at Penn, and it was 2006. And I have to say one of the very fundamental parts of my uh, philosophy of my, uh, who I am, identity I am today is, uh, came from Pan, from my teachers, uh, Morton Amsterdam, Robert Van Arsdal, uh, Dr. Farshad Sanavi. Uh, I had outstanding teachers that were able to- uh, Hold that thought, we're gonna, we're gonna ask you about all those names. We're gonna ask you about all those names. That's coming sure. up. So I um, feel like I got some very good foundation for my education, but when I started to practice in 2010, uh, following what I learned in my residency, I realized that not everything is, is working. Not all the puzzle pieces are coming together. And um, airway in 2010, 2011 was not on the map in orthodontics and was not on the map in my practice. Uh, so after I uh, worked for about 12 months and I started to take some medical history looking at my cases that I have expanded with uh, traditional protocol, I saw that it's not stable, that something is missing. And uh, I had one patient that uh, I uh, referred to the ENT because we found huge tonsils uh, uh, on the CBCT and clinically, and he was very symptomatic with ADHD. He was a 12-year-old child, and he ended up being diagnosed with severe obstructive and uh, central sleep apnea. And I realized that this was the piece that was missing in my practice, in my diagnosis, and I started to self-educate myself. At that time, we didn't have many courses, if any, 2011, 2010 on this in this field as we have today and uh, i think this is where it all started wow so this is beautiful okay so you bring us back in time and now so we know where you're coming from with this thinking process but now the question is so let's inform the people about what is the procedure that you do and then i will ask you technical questions because of course, after I get inspired by you, we have to try. So with softwares, I develop different alternatives to guide the surgery and stuff like that, that I know that you probably make it way more easier. But let's start with the foundation of the concept. What you're trying to achieve, what is the procedure? We will, I already described it, it's a rapid expansion, but give us a little insight about the process and then we will talk about the technicalities, 
compare with regular orthopedics that is in the way that I get trained, for instance, to use these kind of devices. So let us know a little bit about how you do it, what is the time? I know that you personally are patient. Actually, your gap is getting bigger. And then we will talk in general about what is the effects and benefits that we have uh, after all this, what you're looking for. So basically, uh, I would like to start with uh, the diagnosis. So the reason why um, we do expansion, and I think the terminology that we have uh, used in the past, such as rapid maxillary expansion, rapid palatal expansion, is a little bit becoming outdated and it's really not uh, based on today's CBCT evidence reflecting exactly what is happening in human body in the human face uh, from that procedure. Uh, so uh, let's start with the diagnosis. The reason why we are stretching with facial structures, because it's not just maxilla, we are st stretching the mid facial structures of your face with this technique because mid facial deficiency is one of the most common problems in malocclusion today. Uh, as a matter of fact, you will probably not find any malocclusion that has a normal maxilla in shape right. and in size. So it's a very important uh, treatment if we can address it. Uh, skeletally, because the problem starts with the bone. The problem ends up at the level of the teeth, but it starts with the bone deficiency. Uh, so what we can do with this uh, protocol, we are opening uh, maxillary mid-palatal uh, mid suture, and also we are opening sutures much higher above the maxilla at the level of um, uh, circumaxillary uh, mm -hmm. sutures. So you are making a change at the level of mid face. And it is very clinically significant because if you are uh, going to make this change about the dentition, nasal cavity, which is the entry into your airway, is going to be affected. And it's going to be affected significantly more than we are used to see with the traditional two supported expanders. The reason why, because we are actually using the bone anchors or temporary implant devices to apply the pressure to the bone directly by passing the teeth. And when we apply the pressure closer to the center of resistance, closer to those uh, skeletal uh, sutures, uh, we are getting significantly uh, more skeletal uh, correction than we used to get with the traditional to supported expander. So we are changing the mid phase of uh, human body. Okay, for a neuroseptic standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. how is the stimul stimulation to the bone level in the mm -hmm. osteoceptors in comparison with the periodontal ligament? That is something really important that you talk about it uh, because most people also are afraid to use expansers when they connect it with teeth because the sensitivity of the periodontal ligament is running in different levels in comparison what has the tendency to create uh, bone loss. That is what people is more afraid to get the, the teeth out of the, 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 the ridges, right? So for the, the scientific standpoint, what you can tell us about that differentiation in the cells and, and how that process make it different than just traditional expansion? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at the histology of the connective tissue in the mid-palatal suture or any suture of the skull uh, and the periodontal ligament, uh, the only difference that you will find is in the periodontal ligament on one side, that ligament or connective tissue is attached to the bone. On the other side, it's attached to the surface of the root. But histologically, it's exactly the same connective tissue as you see in the sutures of the bone. In the sutures of the bone, as we see in the metapalatal suture, that connective tissue connects two portions of the two halves of the bone. Uh, so it's bone to bone versus tooth to bone uh, connection. And uh, obviously periodontal ligament uh, is very uh, 
uh, it's a sensory one, organ and it's very sensitive. And uh, uh, when you look at the uh, forces that you can apply to the teeth, uh, the teeth are significantly weaker than the bones. So that's why in all the patients, when you have an uh, increased surface area of the intervegetation in the suture, where you have to apply significantly higher forces to open that suture, uh, the teeth cannot withstand those forces and the teeth are going, even if the patient doesn't feel a lot of pain or sensitivity in the tooth, the teeth are going to uh, uh, expand beyond of biologic envelope of what is biologically acceptable for the tooth to be in the bone. So the teeth are weaker than that metapalatal suture in all the patients. That's why uh, every single paper that you see in orthodontics in all the patients after adolescent growth spurt is recommending to involve either a surgery or a skeletal anchorage to expand when we choose to put orthopedic forces on the bone uh, because orthopedic forces are not for the teeth in all the patients. So uh, there is a significant difference in terms of what tooth can tolerate before the damage is done and what the bone can tolerate to uh, respond uh, to the stimulus. So we okay. want to get away so from now, the pressure on the teeth. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, you have, uh, when, <laughs> when you place uh, uh, these um, implant retained uh, expanders in, the, in there, uh, do you also uh, um, uh, uh, start or, or pinpoint to get the process started in the mid palate or so we find, uh, and I might, my experience might be a little bit different from other clinicians that are doing it on a regular basis today, but we find that there is a significant difference between female and male adult patients. Uh, so far in our practice, we have not, uh, uh, there was no need to do any type of adjunctive a stimulation of the bone with perforations in females. And the oldest female that I have treated is 64. And I am treating a lot of females older than 40 with this approach. So females so far opening without additional uh, surgical intervention. On the other hand, uh, when we talk about males, and I honestly personally looking at the CBCT data that we are collecting, uh, find that it's a, a lot of it has to do with the uh, nasal bones uh, and sutures in the nasal bones and maxillary nasal complex. Uh, so we find that male patients older than 25 uh, have less chance of having that uh, non-surgical uh, bone opening. Uh, we, do we try? Absolutely. We will still try in any wow. male at the age of 35. But uh, we have not had a single male under the age of 25 that failed to open, and we did not use any uh, surgical uh, corticopuncture stimulation. But older than 25, the statistics are changing, and uh, there is much less chance for that male to respond without any surgical intervention. What about patients with uh, mid mid size to large uh, torus? Mm -hmm. Mid-palatal tori. Yes. We uh, find that uh, mid-palatal tori is not as uh, much of a problem as we might think. So mid-palatal uh, tori still is opening. It could be a problem for the fit of the appliance, uh, but not uh, for the sutural opening uh, in females, at least. Okay. Possibly in uh males. So that quality of that bone for that exostosis doesn't uh, create a more difficult vector or pattern to break with the expansion? It, uh, we have not, we have treated many patients with palatal tori when it comes to females. Uh, so I would say that it was not an interference uh, for opening of the palate in males. I uh, didn't treat that many mal males with palatal tori, so I don't have the answer, but if you want to have like evidence-based answer, I don't think we have the answer based on the literature because this is very new concept. 
So do you think that the women respond better because the amount of elastin and collagen just because the women have developed to open the pelvis to birth and you think that has some influence? I think there has to do uh, some hormonal uh, components to this uh, ability to open the sutures of the skull. I uh, think uh, this might be the new area for not just the dental orthodontic research, but for medical research to really understand the difference uh, between the female and males in terms of their bone physiology and how the hormones affect the sutural uh, remodeling. Uh, so I think there is definitely something hormonal, uh, I think. And oh. I have been speaking to uh, the medical doctors that uh, know a little bit about bone physiology and the hormones, and uh, there is definitely uh, uh, agreement and uh, on that part that there has to be a hormonal uh, response uh, difference between females and males. Okay. Now let's talk some little bit about mechanics and devices. Uh, again, since I saw you, I went really interested. So I've been looking for different kind of devices. I found different references, different vectors of forces. Is one that has like a little hinge into the back, it have like a, a movement to so create an expansion into the front, but the posterior is more conservative. I found something, so another one that goes connected to the first molar with bands. So I assume that they do in a connection. Let's start with that differentiation between components before we start talking about the vectors of positioning and the anchoring direction. Because again, all this, I just, after I saw, I came back to the computer. I said, let me see what I'm going to do. And I start checking in the CVCT. I mean, and I will laugh, we kind of try, but we were afraid to turn it in the way that you do. So we're going to have three topics that we're going to talk. Let's talk about these two devices, the classification of the elements that you use for the disjunction. Then we will talk about the position that we place it and the position of the vectors uh, when you're going to make the anchor because that's what you, we've been all the struggle when we want to try just uh, in the first attempt, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are... Uh, I have to say that the vectors and the devices, it, it's kind of one topic because uh, there are s several devices available to us today and uh, they have different vectors of uh, course application. So one of the devices that we are using in adults is uh, a device called MSE. It's maxillary, maxillary skeletal expander. Uh, by a Korean uh, biomaterials company. And it was originally developed by um, Dr. Moon uh, from UCLA. Uh, so this device uh, includes four implants that are placed um, in the palatal uh, floor or the par uh, right parallel to the mid palatal suture along the same plane. And it also involves uh, two bands on the upper first molars that are connecting, connected to the expansion screw itself. So it's not uh, completely a two spray appliance, it's a combined uh, skeletal and two supported appliance. And um, uh, the benefit of this device uh, being used in adults is that the screw, uh, activation screw is actually a uh, hex. So it, there are a lot of force that is required to be applied to the bone in adults to really open those palatal sutures. That's why uh, we have some evidence uh, with our cases where uh, the screws may fracture or the screws may uh, bend as a result of failure of the palatal uh, or circumaxillary sutural opening. Uh, so there is a lot of force being applied and it's better to apply this force to uh, something, uh, a device like a, a TAD that can fail rather than to have the system fail, such as biologic uh, side effect and uh, periodontal failure. Uh, so I think um, uh, this is one of the devices that we use in adults. The benefit is that the implants are placed very close to the mid suture. The downside is those bands on the molars. So if you have a patient with 
weak horizontal support, those molars are going to tip. They are going to come a little bit outside the bone. And that's why we try to disengage the molars as soon as possible into the expansion process. Oh, so but you start with the connection with the molars first, and then you cut it. Yes. And then you always you start with them. You never place it without the molars engaged? I, uh, I think in patients um, under the age of um, 25, you don't need the molars engaged. I think um, in patients that already had a sutural opening, where you are going for the second round of expansion, I think those patients also don't need the molars engaged. But today, we, we really need more data to kind of compare different groups to answer that question, and we don't have the data to answer this yet. No. Um, the second type of device is uh, something that oral surgeons can do. It's called TLS distractor. And this device is, um, requires incisions on the palatal slopes in the area of insertion of that, those uh, side bars. Uh, it's a little bit more invasive device and uh, could be significant tissue infringement and inflammation associated with it. But uh, it, it seems like it's working as well in some of the oral surgeons' uh, hands that have been using this device. Uh, the third option is um, utilizing acrylic pads with the four implants or two implants, depending on the age of the patient, and we actually covered this uh, very thoroughly in our courses, uh, is um, uh, basically the implants are placed in the palatal slopes and they are secured to the screw with a special uh, composite material called triad uh, party that you use for your custom tray fabrication. Uh, you connect acrylic to this triad party. And there are several uh, variations of this uh, technique that you can utilize. But the implants are placed um, in the palatal slopes between the roots of the teeth. So the bone is a little bit softer in those areas. And uh, the, for the vector, of course, is actually much better than in the MSE device. The problem is that those, because you apply axial uh, force uh, to those implants. However, the implants are farther away from those sutures that we are trying to open. Uh, so uh, you won't be as successful opening those sutures in adults as you will be in uh, young adults and in adolescent patients under the age of 25 and under the age of uh, 18. Uh, so I yeah. think mm -hmm. there are many options uh, to utilize uh, this uh, protocol uh, many techniques and you really need to have many tools in your toolbox to really get that process uh, going and get a good result. Right. In, in our limited uh, ex, uh, experience, uh, we used the last one, uh, the last model with the mm -hmm. acrylic pads and, and uh, implants in the, in the slopes, which is exactly that experience that I had, that uh, the, 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 especially the distal uh, implants got loose very quickly, and I found that um, they were not putting as much pressure on the suture as I as I wanted them to mm -hmm. to do. This um, device this device is really um, designed for younger patients under the age of eighteen, or in adults you can use it as a second or third expander to just fine tune expansion to finish widening once your sutures are already open, but not as the device to uh, open the suture in adults. Okay, that's what happened. I mean, you see how we learn. We here for learning. We live okay. and we learn. That's it. The <laughs> mesial, the, the mesial uh, uh, implants did well, and we did accomplish a good amount of uh, expansion on that. Uh, it was a 50-year-old uh, female patient, and, and it, it did happen. Um, but uh, uh, that brings me uh, to another question, doctor. Uh, most of this, we're talking about lateral expansion. And uh, as you, uh, you know, uh, uh, the first thing that uh, you mentioned, the mid-face deficiency always makes me think of the sagittal. What are we to do with that sagittal deficiency? What do you do? Yes. So this is uh, based on my uh, experience and evaluation of multiple CBCTs of treated patients. You cannot really separate uh, 
uh, horizontal deficiency from the AP or the surgical uh, deficiency. If, you, if you're talking about maxillary hypoplasia, it's one problem. Maxilla doesn't shrink this way and this way. It shrinks three-dimensionally. Mm -hmm. So the word expansion or expanders that we use in our field uh, is associated just with horizontal expansion is not right. Because you, if you are going to do proper expansion for the maxilla, just by opening the mid palatal suture alone, you're going to have a significant AP change in that maxilla. But it, there is a threshold that you have to buy, uh, surpass to get that AP correction. Uh, so there is enough evidence in the literature that just from opening the mid palatal suture, in all the patients, there is a rotation component to the maxilla where it will rotate uh, up to a millimeter and a half forward. So they're going to be in very mild um, AP uh, or class three cases, uh, improvement in the class three or AP deficiency of the maxilla. But if you just uh, take a patient that has midfacial deficiency, and sometimes it seems to you that there is no AP, Almost all the patients that have uh, transverse deficiency have AP deficiency. And as, as long as you do the proper opening of the mid palatal suture, you're going to affect maxilla significantly in AP. So it does still glide forward. It's not just this way. So it's mm -hmm. not just lateral, but it's a glide and opening forward as well. Uh -huh. Like but an umbrella. Like an umbrella, like an uh, accordion like an accordion. Uh, so uh, definitely, uh, when I look at my patients um, where we do the non-surgical AP correction versus expansion alone, I think most of the AP correction without surgery happens from sufficient opening of the mid palatal suture. So if you open that suture just a little bit, you only see changes at the horizontal level. But if you open it enough, and there is a formula that can be applied how to do it to get more AP correction, you're going to see a significantly more change in the AP as well. Correct, but uh, the amount that you open also is somewhat limited with what we have on the bottom. So uh, on the upper arch, we do have this chance of now with these tools to open quite a bit. What do we do on the lower arch if it is also uh, mm -hmm. rather than... than Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so if you look at today's evidence, the evidence that we have on the relationship uh, in terms of proportions between maxillary deficiency and mandibular situation is that, uh, interestingly, the narrower the maxilla, the wider the mandible is going to be. So patients that have the bilateral crossbite have wider mandible than the patients that don't have a bilateral. True, True. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Usually there is a dental compensation at the level of the mandible to compensate okay. for the maxillary deficiency. So if you look at the CBCT, the only way to do it right is to actually do the virtual setup and upriting of the mandibular dentition like you do on the articulator for your restorative case. So you have the virtual setup of the mandibular teeth to the proper inclination, and you will be surprised how much you actually can change in maxilla uh, to fit with the mandibular uh, dentition. Uh, so I think it is a little bit uh, also uh, misunderstood that relationship because uh, the only reason why the mandible is going to limit you is if you don't decompensate the teeth properly and if the mandible is severe class two. So severe class two, the mandible is severely deficient in AP. And that means that sometimes that mandible has to come forward with the surgical intervention. Okay. Otherwise, um, the mandible is also as moldable, moldable as maxilla in transverse, it's moldable at the level of the teeth with the right. Thank you. Now let's talk about positioning. Uh, because also that interact different in the way that we make orthopedics in kids, right? So 
what is the placement when we're trying to work in kids we want to go a little more anterior with the device like uh we put it in like the inclination in the area into the canine area i see in most of these devices put it more in the posterior area what can be the perfect spot to have the screw by itself because we know that the extensions in acrylic or the arms or the bars is still deflecting a little bit of the strength uh, of the device. So what position you will see need to be the main force to which level? Uh, you mean, um, at the, I, I didn't understand the question very well. You mean the position of the screw? Yeah, the main screw because this is where the force is more. Uh, you put it behind in the papilla, like the area near to the to the canines, and then, or you put it in the area, by uh -huh. or you put it into the area near to the premolars. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it depends on the patient. So the beauty of this approach is that uh, some patients have more deficiency in the front, so you try to place that screw a little bit more in the anterior area, and some patients have more problem in the back. So you have flexibility and it, it's a hundred percent customized approach uh, for each patient. So you can place it a little bit more anteriorly. You can place it in the center of the maxilla, which uh, in my opinion is ideal in terms from the front to the back of the maxilla. Or sometimes you place it more posteriorly, but it depends where the problem is the most pronounced. Uh, okay. So that's why we placed it. Now let's talk a little bit about the activation timing. That, that was what was more blow me away because mm -hmm. you know so I'm like I'm doing expansion in my daughter and you know in orthopedics we make like one turn every two weeks because we work with a concept that is called presence. We just want the the, the bone move away physiologically, getting away naturally. Here just. Can you share how much is the activation? Because it's quite a lot. But also, I want that you talk about that what you what you extend into the screw is not necessarily what you gain into the bo the, the bone, and how you reset the appliance. And remember, I have the luxury to see you twice, so I just want that in this little conversation we don't lose the main yeah, point that catch my attention. Our questions and. Uh... Uh, we're coming down to the last uh, 20 minutes. Uh, okay. So last okay. one, that last one, and then we'll start with the formal part. Okay. Sure. So uh, the activation is a very important uh, question to discuss uh, because we have, um, we are talking obviously about skeletal immature patients. Uh, skeletal immature patients do not have fusion in the facial sutures that they have increased interdigitation of the sutures where it is going to be required more force to open them up. So the activation is different to open those sutures and to widen them. So there are two stages uh, to expansion. One stage is opening of the sutures. Unlike in children, the suture starts opening with the first turn because the sutures are open. In a skeletal immature patient, you have to stimulate a little bit more uh, the bone to open those sutures. And once that bone opens, then you can slow down. So if it is somebody uh, like adolescent patient between 12 to 18, uh, we start with one turn a day. And once we see like half a millimeter of uh, increase in the diastema, you can slow down to uh, two turns a week, uh, three turns a week. So you don't want to open large diastema. You want to get away from the rapid expansion protocol. You want to slow down. And this is the tendency today in the whole profession is to get away from that rapid protocol because the rapid protocol will open large diastema and it's going to take slower to heal and there could be some rebound. So we want to slow down the process. In adults, it could be four to five turns a day, uh, depending on the screw. Each screw has a different amount of opening in the screw. Uh, like for example, a traditional expansion screw has uh, approximately five turns uh, to open it one millimeter. The MSE is different. It will require like closer to seven, eight turns. It's 
uh, six turns to achieve 0 0.8 millimeter opening of the screw, so that's different. Uh, so what we find that in adults, um, we also customize it and we would uh, open the screw uh, the day of the procedure up to six to eight turns to stimulate oh. the bone uh, until the patient feels something in the bone. Wow. And then you slow down to four turns a day, two in the morning, two at night, until the suture opens. Once that Early suture crack, opens, you can, you can go down. Well, it's not always happening like that in adults, but sometimes you you actually fracturing the bone. In, in some situations, the patients really feel like the bone is fracturing. So you want to be gentle. You want to calibrate each patient to what they can tolerate and what the bone requires. And once that suture is open, you can do two turns a day. One I is actually, usually not enough. I actually can understand that, uh, that uh, logic because that screw, I was thinking about that, is the strongest at that point that you place it on up to about 28 days. At that point, it's actually going to be looser than the day that you put it on. So if you go slower, it's possible that later... Nothing will happen. Correct. Yeah, so, so there, is, there are two things that you have to remember. Is the screw, actually three things, the screw, the bone that we are trying to open, and the implants. So you cannot go too slow in the very beginning, because remember, that your implants, the rules that apply to your traditional dental implants in terms of primary and secondary stability apply exactly the same to the temporary anchorage devices. So you, you are relying on the primary stability of those implants to achieve that sutural opening. So if you're going to go slow, and within four weeks of going slow, the implants are getting weaker and weaker. So you're applying more forces to the teeth or to that screw. So there is very high chance that the bone is not going to open at all. So you have to be more aggressive in the beginning, as long as your implants are stable. And then there you go. that's the other mistake we made. Yeah, you see. <laughs> but I have another question, Hamid, but we cannot end up okay. with, the gap, with the gap open. Now we need to find out how we're going to close the gap. So, <laughs> honestly, this is, we're going to get in time. So tell us now, and I'm sorry, I, don't need, I know that I'm squeezing you, but I want your brain here. So then you break and you create the diastema. To which point you start making the centrals to start getting together? Can you combine those forces? And if you do, what can be the more ideal way to do it? Can you do with your simple braces and elastics and start moving one at a time, or you have solutions? It's just a control yeah. arch uh, um, type of mechanism, isn't it? So uh, interesting is that, um, you know, if the periodontium along all maxillary teeth is healthy, you have something that we call transeptal fibers. Transeptal fibers are um, those types of periodontal fibers that are responsible for the arch integrity, or they connect all the teeth together. So as soon as you stop turning the expander, those transeptal fibers are stretched and they are going to uh, bring those teeth together. So patients that did not go through the surgical expansion protocol, they show uh, diastema closure even without putting the braces on within a month, that diastema will start closing. And so much faster. Uh, our uh, recommendation is uh, light, minimal forces applied to the teeth throughout the whole treatment, any orthodontic treatment that we are doing. Uh, that's biologically the healthiest thing you can do to that periodontal ligament. Uh, so there is no contraindication from uh, placing braces right away when you go through this process. Uh, but uh, you definitely do not want to put any uh, A chains or elastics to start uh, actively close the diastema. The role of the braces and the wires is to guide the teeth. So as you are allowing those transeptal fibers to bring the crowns of the teeth together, the brackets and the wires are keeping the roots upright. So I think we need to do more research in orthodontics, how 
via closing the, those big diastomas, especially after orthognathic surgery. And I think uh, some of the answers that we see based on our clinical data, we have very little research on closing diastema after expansion from periodontal standpoint, is that if you wait too long to close that diastema, the bone that is going to be filled between those central incisors is dense mm -hmm. cortical bone. And there is nothing worse than moving the tooth through the cortical bone. Uh, this is a risk of root resorption, uh, and uh, it's going to be a, a significantly slower process than moving the tooth through immature uh, uh, bundle, uh, med medulla bone. So I think uh, besides needing more research in the area, I think do not put heavy forces to close and force the diastema close as soon as you can. Try to guide the teeth. Try to focus on getting the diastema open. Monitor when the diastema starts opening and then slow down so you don't open large diastemas. So you let the biology close the gap as naturally uh, as possible with minimal forces applied. Fantastic. Beautiful. Now I can breathe. Now all yours, Hamid. All right. All right. Now we're going to get to oh, the. By the way, by the way, this is my diastema. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's going. Yeah. I have my expanded. This diastema did not get well, bigger than this. Marianne, so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see, show you mine. Get not bigger diastema than this. <laughs> oh, I, I got double on both sides. I'm moving this segment forward, so it's very in today. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're going to get to the question and answer. Um, okay. Marcus, and, and since you made a, a, a reference at the very beginning about your uh, interest in occlusion, that's where we're going to start, Marianne. Tell me, what is occlusion to you? And, and of course, you did tell us the name, but you said them too fast. Uh, my second part of the question was, who were your influences? Uh, that's what I was telling you. We're going we're gonna to write them down. Mm -hmm. So, I know that there are a lot of uh, philosophies and concepts about occlusion. Um, I, even until today, and I'm only 10 years into this next month, I will celebrate 10 years since I graduated from my residency. So I'm very new to this. I'm still learning um, to this. Uh, so I have to say that uh, occlusion for me is... Uh, uh, maximum intercuspation. It's stability for the joints to minimize the muscle activity, to minimize uh, joint loading. So the teeth have to provide uh, that stability with uh, allowing maximum intercuspation. So when you look at the ancient occlusions, before we saw uh, crowding and malocclusion that we see today when we had where of the dentition, there is one thing that is common in what is uh, considered acceptable occlusion today, physiologic, and what was acceptable at that time is having as many contacts as possible. Uh, so I am not sure if uh, where the concept of canine guidance or a lot of other concepts in occlusion come from. Occlusion is a very difficult um, area to study. Uh, but I have to say that, that as an orthodontist, as a periodontist, I want two things. I want to have maximum number of contact between the upper and lower teeth. And I also Does that want... that mean maximum number of teeth in contact also? Yes. <laughs> well, we are talking about the integrity, so I assume that we have the the full dentition. Full set of dentition. Just, just want to set it for the record. <laughs> so I want to have maximum intercuspation. I want to have uh, minimal muscle activity. So you, the system works with minimal effort. You cannot separate teeth from the uh, joints and the teeth from the muscles. Thank and you. I also want to have the teeth in the bone. I want to have axial loading. So if you ask me what I believe, what is for me the most important as an orthodontist, as a periodontist, is to have teeth in contact throughout the arch from the back to the front, light contact in the front, a little bit stronger contact 
in the back um, and every single tooth should be axially loaded. That means there should be supporting bone circumferentially around. around all the teeth from the front to the back, from the mesial to distal uh, to allow that axial loading and that force to be transmitted directly to the uh, rest of the facial skeleton. So that's what uh, is uh, my goal in my treatment. Fantastic. You consider cervical spine and airway as a part of the definition of occlusion or just independent components? that they don't get tied together with occlusion. What is your thought about that? I think you cannot, the only thing that is separating these elements is uh, our specialties. But we are talking about one system. So you cannot separate uh, the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. You cannot separate uh, the cervical spine from the head of the patient, from the airway. So I think it's all related and I think, um, the key is to uh, allow, even for the cervical spine, the most natural head posture allows the axial loading of the spine. So we want to create, uh, the, uh, if we have to address the problem, we want to allow that axial loading of the spine. We don't want to have the forward head posture where the muscles are uh, basically holding the skull. The spine should be holding the skull, supporting the skull. I not the muscles. Uh, I guess uh, what we're trying to ask is that do you believe that uh, different uh, type of malocclusion or correct occlusion can have an effect on the cervical, on the integrity of cervical spine? On mm -hmm. mandibular think, position because I think they both go related. I think we have to remember that malocclusion, the way the, uh, it presents clinically is adaptation to some kind of uh, malfunction. So a lot of malocclusion will be uh, a form to adapt to the forward head posture. So it's very uh, difficult in one individual patient to separate uh, where is the chicken, where is the egg, but it's all related. And it could start with the head posture, with the cervical spine, it could start with the respiratory, apparatus and it could start with the oral apparatus. So I think there are so many different variations and combinations that uh, the patient may present with uh, and it's always multifactorial but I think there is no question that malocclusion is adaptation and it could be the cause of other components of the system uh, being more susceptible to break down because that malocclusion can only solve so much of the uh, problem in terms of the level of adaptation. So I think uh, it, it's very complex. It's not a simple answer. To your question. Yeah, I <laughs> okay, um, uh, second question, Marianne, is uh, which factors do you consider prior to stabilization of your patients? You know, such as which? Uh -huh. saying things as we talked, like posture, airway, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things of that nature. So we uh, look at the, I mean, I feel like I still am not where I want to be in terms of my comprehensive uh, treatment and uh, treatment planning and diagnosis, but we definitely consider the breathing. We definitely consider habits. We definitely consider uh, postural uh, components of uh, functional uh, side of, to our patients and what we can help them with. Uh, but for me, uh, I think the way I think and the way I see uh, the looking back at our results is that uh, if the patient has a problem, it's a vicious uh, cycle. And we have to intervene and break that vicious, vicious cycle, vicious circle of problems. So my uh, belief is that you have to start with the structural correction. If somebody has a dysfunction, when it's postural, when it's uh, breathing, you want to obviously address the breathing, but sometimes it's impossible to address the breathing without, without addressing the structure. So we are very lucky in orthodontics that we can change the maxilla. 
uh, unlike mandible or any other part of your head, maxilla is the most moldable structure in adults and in children. So we, uh, maxilla is the foundation of healthy respiration and healthy oral function. So we have that opportunity to set that maxilla right in adults and in children. So that's my focus. So we set the foundation, we set that maxilla in volume, in size, in shape to what it should be in the natural environment as much as it can. We can do it, correct it. And then we start addressing the function around it. Because a lot of times that uh, function will self-improve after you address the maxilla. And a lot of times patients need additional help. What I don't believe is right is start working with the function when maxilla or the bones are deficient and there is no good foundation for that system to work in axial loading mode. So for me... By function, yeah. do you mean, by function, do you mean uh, uh, oral myofunctional therapy to start? Or, uh, like tongue exercises, uh, myofunctional therapy, unless it's just strengthening exercises I think sometimes um, it's impossible to get a good result un unless you change the structure. Uh, so I think um, it's a very difficult question to answer because we need more research to see what works the best. But you cannot separate function from structure. And my philosophy is if the structure is so easy to fix, when it comes to the mid phase, let's fix the structure first and then erase the old memory because the muscles are attached to the structure. So you change the structure, you erase the old memory of the muscles, then you have a better foundation to reteach those muscles how to function better. No doubt about it. I love the spaghetti test, by the way. The spaghetti as the exercise. That was so amazing. <laughs> no, she put a video of her daughter doing the spaghetti test. And that's oh, yeah. really, really cool. I put my daughter just to watch it. Now I need to do a spaghetti tonight. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to do that. So, okay, uh, Ma Mariana, uh, which type of information or, or diagnostic records do you take mm -hmm. at this point? So we take um, uh, the videos of the patient. Video. We take uh, the a lot of pictures of the posture of the face of the bite, and of course we take CBCTs. Okay. And bite registration. Bite registration? Mm -hmm. And habitual bite or their their treatment position? Maximum intercuspation, is that what we're taking? We, uh, we take a habitual bite, we take CR. There is still a place why you need to know where a CR uh, bite is. Oh, like okay, I think we're going to need another hour for you to explain which, which yeah, you are so, we're talking about. So we take a lot of uh, registrations of the bite to, uh, to see where the patient's heart is. Fantastic. But, uh, but your main radiographic is basically a CBCT because you have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, so now um, I think that uh, aside from the CBCT, uh, are you guys using any other instrumentation? Uh, do you ever take MRIs, looking at the joint, uh, soft tissue, or uh, draw tracking? Not on the regular basis, uh, but uh, in patients with some joint pathology we do. And we are very fortunate in our facility where we work that we have a very nice imaging center where we can refer our patients. That's nice. <laughs> All right. How about uh, jaw tracking or, or uh, kinetic movement or chewing cycles? Do you guys no, check any of that? I, I don't check them. All right. Um, how about the uh, um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, approach? Do you guys ever work with uh, PTs, uh, chiropractors, or uh, other? Uh, you probably work with some ENTs or some uh, sleep physicians, correct? Yes, yeah, so we work uh, in our practice with um, myofunctional therapists, we work okay. with allergists, ENTs, uh, sleep physicians, and uh, some uh, chiropractors that are uh, focusing more on the TMJ and uh, uh, spine and uh, also neck, cervical uh, musculature. So we do work uh, and we were we are very lucky in our area that we have a few of them that 
have uh, completed uh, courses on um, restoration uh, breathing and they uh, are a little bit more knowledgeable about the whole system. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, next we want to talk about the sequence of treatment. Uh, what is your normal sequence of treatment after your workup? Um, mm -hmm. Can you uh, delve into that? Are you guys uh, looking uh, for a specific uh, functional trajectory or, or uh, even for a uh, you know, vertical? Mm -hmm. So um, our sequence of treatment depends obviously on the patient, but when it's generalized, generalized. Mm -hmm. it have to uh, be you mean uh, my sequence when I start the treatment or just in general? In general, you know, when the patient comes, you look, you say, okay, this maxilla is deficient, um, and this is how I have to go forward. Mm -hmm. So if the patient is asymptomatic in the TMJ, that they don't have, they, they might have some structural changes in the TMJ, but are asymptomatic, have reproducible uh, jaw relationships, uh, have no pain at, uh, when I check uh, the seated joint position. So I think those patients are ready to go through the uh, skeletal uh, and orthodontic uh, reconstruction. And so we do not, if that maxilla is deficient, there is nothing that I start with but with maxillary correction. And so we start with expansion. If there is a joint, uh, active uh, joint breakdown, breakdown, if there is an active joint uh, disease where you see a resorption, you see that the patient is symptomatic, then you have to start with the joint. I do not start any orthodontic treatment on symptomatic patients uh, on the TMJ end. Uh, so we start with correcting the structure. If they have a tongue tie, the tongue tie is addressed after maxilla is expanded and they start uh, myofunctional therapy. If uh, they have uh, any type of the airway problem, uh, then we work on the, those patients with the team, with uh, allergy specialists. With now, team. during during this time that you're making the expansion in order to break down the engaging of the occlusion, because the occlusion relation can be a limitation to allow the proper expansion, mm -hmm. How are you disengaging the teeth? Are you putting a removable appliance? Or are you making build-ups on top of the posteriors to break down and just allow those teeth to don't be engaged into the occlusion so they can move faster? Uh, well, if there is a real problem with occlusion, uh, usually we use uh, the uh, uh, composite build-ups. We do not do any removable appliances during expansion. Okay. Okay, we great. can theoretically use the bite plate in the mandible, but we try, the expansion process is already a challenge for the patient's everyday life. So we try to be as simple as possible. So we try to minimize the number of appliances, minimize the responsibility of the patient to wear something additional and make it as simple as uh, possible. But in a lot of patients that it may look to you that occlusion is locking, once you start expanding, the occlusion will simultaneously start changing. So not all the patients that are going through expansion need to be uh, disarticulated with uh, the buildups. Oh, okay. It's a very dynamic uh, process. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, uh, modify the next question. Uh, normally, we ask how much of a, a factor uh, is facial aesthetic in your treatment, but I'm gonna just ask you that uh, uh, how much of uh, how much of a consideration it is uh, to you when you start, you know, the facial aesthetics to you when you start the cases. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, facial aesthetics is uh, you cannot separate it from your whole treatment plan. It's part of it. It's part of the puzzle. And uh, facial aesthetics are used uh, for to evaluate maxillary deficiency, uh, to evaluate the vertical relationships uh, between the jars, to evaluate a relationship. So I think uh, we 
before I do any diagnostics in on the patient, we start with spatial aesthetics, just visual evaluation. So from the beginning, you're you're from the very beginning. Concerned. It's part and of does that. I'm sorry. Does that include incisal uh, display and and and, and gingival oh, display? All that. Absolutely. So you uh, we do uh, three-dimensional treatment planning and treatment. So it it's part of the whole diagnosis. And if you address, so for us, the goal is to address the bone as much as we can. If you address the bone, the teeth will be in a better place in the end. So if the whole case will look better from the aesthetic standpoint. So sometimes you have to do intrusion when the teeth are over erupted. So I think you do have to do a, a digital smile design as mm -hmm. part of your uh, comprehensive treatment planning protocol. Perfect. Good. You All see, right. we have more things in common than we imagine. Good. All right. Now we go to question eight and it goes back. Let's go back to that case you were talking about that the patient was symptomatic in the jaw joint and uh, you take the CBCT and you see some, um, some bony changes, uh, let's say degenerative uh, disease on, on one of the condyles. Um, have you worked with uh, any of the, uh, 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 growth factor injections into the uh, into the jaw joint for uh, rehabilitating these or re remodeling these into a healthier state. Have you heard about it? Have you any experience with it? Yes, I have zero experience with the growth factors injections into the joints. I uh, my part in managing the joints uh, in, involves uh, in terms of fabrication of the bite plates and stabilizing, giving the patient a little bit better occlusion temporary occlusal scheme uh, to let the joint heal. I also work with some oral surgeons that will be more likely to utilize those uh, biological uh, injections you know, for those patients. And uh, I think we have to remember the joint is, uh, temporal mandibular joint is a very adaptive organ and has a tremendous potential to heal. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but I probably will belong to uh, those clinicians that are a little bit more conservative uh, with the joint and uh, allowing it as much uh, naturally to heal as possible rather than uh, jumping into the surgical interventions. And We're not uh, talking about surgery here. We're just talking about uh, introduction. It's just an injection. Yeah. 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 And I uh, am not, I have not tried any of the injections. I'm very curious to learn about uh, all these options, but I definitely think there is a place for, for this therapy, no question. Perfect. Do you think that we can benefit to inject growing factors into the suture to um, speed up the healing of the closing? No, because that's why we're here. That's a question that is who better than her to, to answer that, right? What do you think? Can be crazy or can be can make, make sense? You mean after the opening? Yes. It increases the blood supply. It's mentioned something. I think Mariana is frozen. I think so. Uh, it happened with mine a few minutes. Okay. So I'm interviewing you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but how fascinating they, they do some yeah, comments is, about it. Uh, it was great. It's great. So oh, I hope to get her back for the last few. She's frozen. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm so I, I think it was really valuable information. I think it was really good to offer another alternatives uh, in general, the utilization of these. Um, and also look for an, an, another alternative because. Honestly, in many cases that they compromise uh, big time sideways, and then patients they don't want to go for regular expansion or treatment. And I think this became to the side that is like an invisible orthodontic. So I think this one is a good space for these kind of devices. And I'm wondering how we can incorporate setups to do it in combination with clear aligners that I think can be great to be able to predict. So I hope she come back. Part of the question that we did that eventually, I de we definitely need to take courses more about this, but my thinking process is 
how with clear orthodontics now we can start making the setup to try to move those teeth? What can be a good rational sequence? We, we to have start two, don't, don't forget, we have two cases right now in process that uh, we, are, uh, we have done the surgery and activation of the bone and, and uh, we are going through that movement with the aligner. So um, uh, I, will, I will tell you in four and a half, five months how, how those cases are looking and uh, if that movement has happened. Um, although not mid-palatal, we did the uh, decortication in these cases uh, going through and through. So um, we are doing some, some things, uh, but certainly I, I can now see what was our mistake with the other case with the mid-palatal suture. We should have gone a lot faster and uh, the patient would have probably been uh, more comfortable with the gun that thing off sooner. Okay, let me, so I don't get an answer. Nati, do we have any answer? Okay. Okay, so in the meantime, let's see, we hope that she connects or we can say thank you for this amazing. Yeah, Honestly, nice. I think we couldn't squeeze her more. Oh, I, <laughs> I feel bad, but it was so amazing, the information. All so right. I think anyways, we need to wrap it up. Um, so what else we can say to everybody? Thank you so much to be here. Tomorrow is going to be a great day. Let me tell you what we're going to have tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to have uh, Dr. Lukas Lassman uh, from Poland, an amazing, I think the youngest guy I, that is I doing... I don't think we're going to finish exactly in an hour on that one. I, I feel like a lot of good discussions are coming up. Yeah, he's amazing. And actually, he's doing such amazing webinars as well. Um, the beauty of him is he's fully trained in the physical therapy side. And in his clinic, he has this as a regular part of the workflow. He's a full-time physical therapy in his office. And the plan, the workflow that he has is just really, really amazing. Of course, uh, also, we have many, many things in common. I would say uh, he follows the philosophy of Dr. Coy's. And we want also that he explained us a little bit about that connection between the cranio-cervical stabilization by Dr. Rocavaro and how they implemented now uh, with the stabilization phase into the body to the coins, the programmer. So I'm really willing to have him. Plus that also he has a beautiful... Ah, Here we yeah. go. <laughs> I don't know what happened. We got disconnected. <laughs> oh, well, okay. well, we're happy that you're back. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Okay, so let's speed up the question, Hamid, and then... All right, so, so we're, we're getting to the end. Uh, Mariana, in, in reference to your uh, finished cases, uh, do you ever notice uh, postural changes uh, after your treatment? Uh, positive, negative, uh, unexpected, expected? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sometimes uh, we see positive changes in the posture. Sometimes we don't see much change in the posture. Uh, so this is a very interesting area for uh, research, for discussion, but uh, uh, posture is, is definitely a multifactorial problem. And I think um, orthopedic correction of the bite uh, in a lot of the situations will add to the improvement of the posture, no question about it. Fantastic. All right, so um, how about uh, Javier, we skip number 10 because I, I don't know um, the, the philosophical uh, approach to, to, to teaching of the different occlusal philosophy in the school. Do you Why not? That? Let's just try to refresh the question. Do you think okay. at some point we're going to be more everybody into the same page into the occlusion? Because it's still... We have too many things in common, but still we have significant differences between philosophies. That is a fact. Do you think actually, that eventually? We actually, I think, uh -huh. yeah, there, there is, I, I'm sorry to jump in, but actually I think there are common points there. Like you mentioned that you do think that the cervical neck is involved. You do think the airway is involved. You do think the head position is, uh, is uh, key, um, but we're not getting, any of that, even things that we seemingly agree on, uh, taught enough in school. Do you foresee even maybe addition of some of those in schools? Mm -hmm. I think uh, with 
more understanding of the importance that the airway health plays in uh, uh, facial uh, development and uh, uh, overall health of the patient, I think uh, we will not be able to uh, uh, ignore the role of the cervical spine, posture and breathing in uh, dental education. So I think uh, the future is about interdisciplinary education, care and uh, research. Uh, so I think it's going to get uh, more integrated than it is today, uh, but uh, how quickly it's going to take place, um, I'm not sure. Uh, but there is definitely, with the awareness of the, about sleep apnea and airway today, there is no way back. There is absolutely no way back. Thank you. All right. Have Maybe we'll have it for the kids. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yesterday, I have my little one over here. I'm, I'm going to okay. let you go with your beloved question 11, Javier. Okay. Uh, Javier's pet peeve, so... No, it's just that basically the conception for occlusion for many people. So this is a question that they kind of mandate people is asking about these events of rotation and translation into the joints. What do you think? Do you think that they combine effects? Do you think that the joint make the rotation initially as some of the literature they explain? Do you think that it's a translation like many of the new evidence with new equipment? we can see some of those changes. What do you think about those uh, dynamic movements inside the joint? Mm -hmm. I think uh, based uh, on my understanding from the clinical side and from the literature, the majority of the function in our joint is happening at the level of rotation. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong, but I think uh, the system is very, there is nothing more intelligent than our system. It's the problem how we understand it and how much yes, we definitely. learn about it. And uh, the, uh, we are also limited how much we know. You know, we are dentists, we are used to see the tools and we understand how, uh, you know, it relates to us to the surrounding structures. The joint, uh, we don't see with direct vision. So a lot of the you know, science about the joint is based on how we understand. So now with all these additional imaging options uh, and dynamic imaging options, uh, I think as we learn more about uh, the joint, we will be able to understand it more. But I think a lot of the questions about the joint today are still unanswered. Yeah, we, that's what we pray, trying to, to get more people right, with the it ideas. Brings a, brings a good point on, Marianne. Uh, do you really think then uh, uh, that we should have a different education perhaps about the joint because we are dentists? Maybe we should have other professionals that are really experts in joints such as PTs or even chiropractors telling us about or as part of the curriculum even in the schools teaching us about the the, the kinetics and the movements in the, in the jaw joint mm -hmm. i think um, yes uh, there is no question that the more integrative uh, we can do interdisciplinary uh, education uh, the better it is for us to understand yeah, but I think that one of the problem is that limitations of the available research on the joint today. No matter in how dentistry. much. In dentistry. dentistry. In dentistry and even in other fields. I think uh, they might be studying the joint from their end, but there are some things that they are probably missing uh, because they are not looking at occlusion. So I think we really the key is to really design some very good interdisciplinary research uh, to be able to teach exactly what is happening in the joint that's i think for me a start but there is no question that we can learn a lot about the joint and the muscles from the physical therapist now the little final part of the question and then we end up is, so how is your occlusion scheme when you making the cost-force relationship? What is your favorite combination? 
Are you looking for cost fossil relationship? You're trying to get for cost uh, in the dental space. What would you consider that can be the best relationship to, to, uh, to create a more stable occlusion? Uh -huh. So when I uh, do my orthodontic treatment planning, uh, my goal is to uh, actually position the teeth in the bone. So in 99% of the cases, it requires some skeletal correction of the maxilla to achieve it. So once I actually apply every single tooth, I want to be upright in the bone to have as many contacts with the opposing tooth as possible. So I want to have uh, what we call more like a tripod type of contact mm -hmm. in the upper and lower teeth. That's my, I don't want like the contacts to be uh, slope against slope. I want a more a tripod kind of effect. Are you loading? So are you? As you remember from my lectures, my maxillary canines, I need to be maxilla wide enough to allow uh, interproximal space between the root and to allow tucked in canine position. I don't want my canines tipped out. Okay, but, but uh, uh, let me ask you something. In your final positioning, do you believe in recreating the curve of Wilson and, and speed, you know, a, a moderate, normal anatomic amount of curve of speed. Um, the reason I ask is that I've spoken to orthodontists and they flat told me they don't believe in that. In that. They, they go for a flat plane because they like how it looks and the word that they use, I'm gonna tell you, they call it socked in. They like a socked in because that looks really great. But from mm -hmm. our standpoint, we look and we say, hey, that, there's not enough freedom of movement there for the lower jaw. Um, mm -hmm. how, what do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a very important uh, concept, but again, when you look at them, right now we are studying uh, one of the largest collections on human pre-industrial uh, skulls uh, is actually in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania Anthropology Museum. So we are studying those pre-industrial skulls and how the dentitions were functioning and how the skeletal structures were relating to the dentition and occlusion. And uh, we want to have maximum intercuspation between the teeth, whether it's worn dentition or the dentition with minimal wear. But the freedom in function is very critical. So what you are saying is very important. So a lot of times in orthodontic mechanics, you are, toward the end of the treatment, you're going to put A chains and you are uprighting the upper front teeth too much and the, the bite between the upper and lower anterior teeth is too tight. too tight. So that's not good. So I think the relationship between the molars where the occlusion is nicely sucked in is great but there has to be sliding, freedom in sliding in all possible directions. Uh, you. So you have to have that. So I don't know about, I, I, I like minimal curve of uh, Wilson because I like my occlusion to be upright as much as possible. But the more upright the occlusion is, the less tight contacts are in the front, between the front teeth. And uh, the more freedom in lateral and uh, sagittal movements you will have, the more inclined the teeth are to compensate for the basal bone skeletal discrepancies, the more you're going to, to have the sucked in tight bite that is not going- Doesn't allow like for freedom. Bite will not give you the freedom. So there has to be maximum intercuspation and has to be freedom in movement. I love freedom in centric. I don't want to have this one lock. All right. in so, so you're looking for that cusp fossa connection. That's what you mean, maximum intercuspation, not necessarily everything and all the angles and all the in what we what we consider class one, class two, class three uh, mm -hmm. uh, interferences. Mm -hmm. As so we have learned in natology. Mm -hmm. So um, Orthodontic treatment and especially finishing stage of orthodontic treatment is very dynamic stage of treatment and it relies on the PDL. 
So toward the end of orthodontic treatment, we are introducing a functional component to finishing such as uh, chewing exercises that allow the teeth physiologically to settle. So instead of just pulling the teeth with A chains and rubber bands to settle, we introduce chewing gum exercises so the patient, uh, the whole system was, will settle the teeth. All we are doing with wires and brackets and orthodontic rubber bands, we are guiding the teeth, but the forces and angulation of the jaw movement will settle the teeth into the functional uh, maximum interpospation with freedom in the lateral movements. But that will not be possible unless you properly expand maxilla. Beautiful. We don't gonna abuse you anymore, honestly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh you. has been great. Actually, I will see when you were not connected, we make a little review about everything and how we really benefit with this and how we have be able to have answered those questions and a customized way than be able just to make the key points of what it catch my attention in personal and then try to create a full development for this. I can tell you that you have an amazing information and we're really, really looking forward for those 30 minutes lecture uh, because that is gonna be amazing when I get able to see it. I'm lucky that I was able to see it, but I definitely want another people to get engaged. So Mariana, thank you so much. I hope to see you soon. Uh, I hope everything is going well with you and your family. And thank you one more time for this amazing Yes, time. Mariana, thank you so much for making the time uh, with your family and all to be with us uh, for this hour. Uh, you were very gracious uh, with our uh, uh, answering all our uh, pet peeve questions. And uh, they gave us, gave us a great, great, uh, uh, you know, small piece of your experience. And we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.